I'm reading another extract from my book this week. Today we're going to take a couple of pages from the chapter on the NHS, which I find to be particularly horrifying. Obviously the whole book's horrifying, it's about preparation for nuclear war, there's nothing rosy and pleasant in it, although there is, as we know, some black humour to be found. But the NHS chapter just seems to me the most desolate and the most frightening because um, living in the West, living in Britain, we're so used to the fact that we can just pick up the phone and dial 999 and help is available for us. Or we can just turn up at the hospital or the doctor's surgery. After nuclear war, that would be absolutely shattered. Uh, the BMA, the British Medical Association, said in the 1980s that the NHS, they carried out a big um, study about this, about the effects of a nuclear war, and they said that the NHS couldn't cope with one atom bomb Never mind one hydrogen bomb, never mind several, never mind a full nuclear war. The NHS could not cope with one single atomic attack. So yes, it's bleak, it's very bleak. I will read you here the first uh, two, two and a half pages from my NHS chapter and I hope you enjoy it. Aberdeen's Beach Ballroom is a pearly white Art Deco building on the seafront and it looks directly out to the chilly North Sea. Aberdeen might be known as the Granite City, with a reputation as somewhere cold and businesslike, but inside the Beach Ballroom all is a soft, twinkling glamour. The venue's glitzy opening ceremony in 1929 featured a carnival and a masked ball in the distinctive octagonal-shaped ballroom. With costumes ranging from Louis XIV's court to shepherdesses, excited journalists chattered about the big event, reminding partygoers that costumes should not impede the wearer's ability to dance. Quote, The girl who hampers her movement, or those of her partner with a heavy or awkward costume, has only herself to blame and it was hoped that patrons would not come, quote, flamboyantly attired in expansive bustles, or with Swedish peasant hats with gigantic wooden brims, which, invariably, give numerous nasty knocks. Over the years, the Beach Ballroom has hosted big names like the Beatles, Pink Floyd and The Who, and on more humdrum evenings, locals have enjoyed musical talent like Joe Daniels and his Hot Shots, Jimmy Shand and his old-time band, and Dr Croc and his crackpots. The city had a generous helping of nightclubs and dance halls, and during the Second World War they were used to boost morale. One local paper reported how one dance hall band had refused to stop playing during an air raid. Quote, they did it while the Titanic sank, and they did it while Aberdeen was bombed during the big blitz of April 21st, 1943. The band played on. The story proudly tells how the band at the Central Hall in Skeen Street carried on through an air raid, quote, even with the siren sounding, the bombs falling, and the lights flickering, the show always went on. The master of ceremonies in his white gloves kept all the dancers going. And when the band's accordionist finally emerged from the club, he saw, quote, desolation and devastation everywhere. Buildings were burning and there was glass and debris all over the street. Despite acquiring the nickname 
Siren City because of its frequent raids, the people of Aberdeen couldn't be deterred from a drink and a dance, with some venues open six nights a week during the war. But Aberdeen's revellers were denied a wartime twirl at the beach ballroom, as the building was closed and commandeered by the military, not to reopen until the freezing Christmas of 1946. During the war, soldiers would bed down on the octagonal ballroom's famously springy wooden floor, and it was the building's capacity to easily accommodate soldiers in wartime which led to it being given a sinister Cold War role. The file of beige crinkled papers from Aberdeen's council in 1965 show that the beach ballroom would again be called into use if nuclear war threatened. But not for something as benign as a sleepover for squaddies. Instead, the beach ballroom's vast dance floor would be used as an emergency overflow hospital. The city, as required by central government, had planned for nuclear war by assessing its hospital capacity, totting up the estimated amount each of their hospitals could hold if extra beds were jammed in under drastic crowding up arrangements, and also if stretchers were piled into day rooms and recreation areas. They then looked beyond the hospitals to see which buildings in the city could be requisitioned and then also crammed with sick and injured. The beach ballroom was an excellent choice as it had that huge springy space of the dance floor. So it went on the sinister list, as did other entertainment venues such as the Palais de Dance, the Gaiety Restaurant and Donald's Ballroom. Schools and colleges were also a good choice, containing classrooms, gym halls and canteens, which could all be cleared to make way for stretchers and equipment, so they were chosen, as were the YMCA and the local art gallery. Various hotels were also listed. These were ideal as emergency hospitals, as they already contained beds, lifts, corridors and kitchens. And so the Caledonian Hotel, the Northern, the Clifton and the Station Hotel were chosen. There is a grudging logic behind the choice of hotels as emergency hospitals, but it seems absurd to resort to ballrooms and nightclubs, with hundreds of dreadfully burned and injured people huddled and crying on the springy dance floor, screaming for pain relief beneath the ornate cornicing, the stained glass panels and the dead glitter ball. And yet, turning nightclubs and restaurants into hospitals wasn't the most absurd plan for the post-nuclear NHS. As the planners in the north sized up the dance halls of Aberdeen, down in the south they were checking the meadows and roadside verges. With admirable realism, the East Anglia Regional Health Board considered what they would do when their stockpile of drugs ran out and there was no longer a pharmaceutical industry to manufacture replacements. They realised they would have to look at, quote, obtaining medicaments from crude sources, that being the trees, hedgerows, gardens and fields. In planning a miserable return to herbal medicine, they sought the expert advice of Cambridge's botanical garden, and were able to draw up guidance for NHS staff on which local plants might be gathered and safely utilised as medicines. Although there was the proviso that they couldn't know what debilitating effect radiation might have on those chosen plants' efficacy. The list explained how locally sourced plants might be used to treat illness. Unfortunately, none of the herby healers would be of use in tackling massive burns, violent radiation sickness, or the wild pain of crush injuries. Instead, staff were informed that the dried leaves of the foxglove, found in the eastern coastal area of the region, might help with an irregular heartbeat, and that the leafy twigs of mistletoe might ease high blood pressure. Instructions for use? Collect young twigs in spring, and dry at 45 degrees. 
A nuclear winter might well deny us spring. It might also deny us mistletoe by killing all plant life. In fact, the outlook for East Anglia and its healing plant life was not good. Projections placed the region in a Z zone, meaning it was predicted to be smothered in lethal fallout. There will be no gathering of mistletoe twigs in a deadly Z zone spring. Even if they were able to harvest a crop of potent plants, the NHS would be unable to treat the sick and injured for the first 14 days following nuclear attack. In this dangerous fortnight, radiation would be too high to permit movement, so all survivors would be ordered to remain undercover until the levels decreased. This meant injured civilians would need to treat themselves and their loved ones at home, or in the rubble of their home, using basic first aid. We must resort to the family stock of plasters and paracetamol, before dragging ourselves through the ash to reach the medical sucker of the dock leaf and the marshmallow root. East Anglia Health Board therefore recommended people keep a full first aid kit at home containing painkillers, a treatment for stomach upsets, anti-nausea pills, water purification tablets and, quote, a contraceptive, if appropriate. The guidance continued. For a sedative... Seek lime trees to be found in local parks and gardens and add its flowers to hot water. Chew bruised juniper berries for cystitis. Soothe boils with burdock. Roll the seeds of the thorn apple with leaves of colt's foot into a cigarette to relieve asthma. Mustard seeds can be made into an ointment for muscle pain. Oats might be an antidepressant, hops a hypnotic. Forget morphine and antiseptic, and trust instead the witchy concoctions of black whorehound, horsetail and skull cup. The herbs and the dance floors represent the stranger aspects of how the NHS planned for nuclear war. But running alongside these ideas were far more sensible plans, such as beefing up the workforce in advance of attack. And so, the National Hospital Service Reserve was formed, asking the public, quote, What use are you in an emergency? Do you stand back, pale and helpless, hoping that someone else will know how to cope? Are you one of the people who make matters worse by losing their nerve completely? Or do you come forward with cool head and steady hands to do quietly and without fuss whatever ought to be done? As every politician will tell you, it would be wonderful to recruit an extra 100,000 nurses, but the money is lacking. So the Reserve offered a fast and cheap way to provide extra nuclear nurses if the bomb drops. The National Health Service Reserve, headed by the Queen, was a voluntary organisation which sought to create a register of retired nurses, or those who'd otherwise left a nursing career, so that they could be summoned to their local hospital in a time of dire national need. If I can interrupt there, I suppose we saw that slightly during the COVID pandemic, where lots of uh, retired nurses and doctors um, came back to work in a time of dire national need. Okay, I'll resume. And to cope with the endless injured who'd require simple first aid, people with spare time were also asked to join the reserve, for which they'd be given a quick training course by the local Red Cross... And then you've got a whole army of auxiliary nurses also ready to be called into service. Let me turn the page here. I printed my manuscript out, um, which might sound a bit old-fashioned, but I printed it out just so I could see it in paper form and feel the weight of it in my hand and perhaps feel a bit comforted thinking, oh, I have written a book. The reserve was open to men and women, but the recruitment campaigns were clearly aimed at genteel housewives who were striving to do something useful outside the home. Many of these women would have served in voluntary civil defence roles during the war, and the authorities called on them to help their country once again. It was also a pleasing option 
for those who wanted to contribute to civil defence without having to do the more grubby or physically demanding work, such as training for the auxiliary fire service or rescue squads. Nursing was a traditionally feminine way to participate in civil defence, and that is what the reserve's recruitment campaigns of the 1950s emphasised. Ladies in the reserve will, quote, meet so many people, make good friends, find a new interest. No more boredom, no more loneliness. They'll make better wives and mothers too. (laughs) It was an odd combination, telling women they were essential to the country's survival and war, whilst simultaneously patronising them as lonely and bored. It's grand to feel you're wanted and useful and welcome amongst these jolly and capable people, said another advert. There was also the enticement of an attractive uniform and enamel badge. An appeal and then a light insult in the same advert. Only you can save us, good ladies. And wouldn't you like having new friends and a shiny badge? The issuing of badges and uniforms and the call to make new friends did make joining the reserve seem like a return to school. There were even competitions and tests arranged, setting the reserve ladies of one hospital against their local rivals. Four teams of reserves from hospitals in the southwest gathered at Mendip Hospital for a, quote, nuclear test, where they had to pretend the bomb had dropped. Each team were given an 18-bed ward of patients, but told that no doctor was available. And, quote, until one arrived, the nurses had to cope in the best way possible. The panel of judges pronounced themselves impressed and noted that standards had improved. The ladies were awarded points and the winner was announced. That was the ladies of Keensham Hospital. It was all very jolly and portrayed like a school sports day with judges and points and good-natured congratulations. Indeed, it's hard to find a hint of unpleasantness or an acknowledgement that this was being done in anticipation of apocalyptic nuclear war. Well, that was uh, the short extract from the NHS chapter. I hope you liked it. Remember, if you want to support my work, you can do that on Patreon. Please go to patreon.com forward slash Atomic Hobo. And you can find me on Twitter at Julie A. McDowell, on Facebook under Nuclear Britain, or on my website, juliemcdowell.com. And let me say hello and thank you to my latest patron, Andrew Mackey, who signed up a few days ago. Thank you for your support, Andrew. And I'll be back next Monday with another episode.